as we continue in our Advent series carols, we think of Go Tell It on the Mountain. John Wesley Work Jr., he might not have originated this work, but he can take credit for the fact that we still sing it today. As a son of a church choir director, Work grew up in Nashville loving music, and even though he earned his master's in Latin and went on to teach ancient Latin and Greek, his first love continued to be music. And he went on to become the first African-American collector of spirituals. They were passed down orally, so it was difficult for him to put them all together, but he did it. And he published two books, and in his second volume, he published the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Go Tell It on the Mountain. An emphasis today is going to be on Go Tell. As we continue in our Advent series, we're going to see the words of Zechariah about his son John. And what John's role was, was to prepare the way for Jesus. As we see these birth narratives in the gospel parallel, the parallel of Jesus' birth along with John the Baptist. So we'll take a look at that this morning. And what would that have any effect on us today? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love. Thank you for your word to us. Your word that teaches us your word that guides us through this life. So Father, I pray that your spirit that dwells with us here now would teach us that you would be our teacher today, that you would correct us, that you would encourage us, that we would be drawn closer to the heart of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. I encourage you to get your Bibles out that are in front of you, on the rack, on the chair, and turn to Luke Chapter 1, we're going to be looking at a long passage of Scripture today. Last week, Marvin talked about uh, Mary's words that were hope-filled and joy-filled in the Magnificat. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 46, starting there, we are now going to see the birth of John the Baptist in Luke 1, starting in verse 57. I encourage you to leave your Bibles out as we go through this passage today. You're going to be reading a lot of scripture, so it's helpful to engage that way. If you're unfamiliar with where that is at, just look more towards the back of the Bible and the New Testament and the Gospels. On my page, it's 1459. We know we have a couple different versions out there, different Bibles, but Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 57, going till verse 80, titled The Birth of John the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. They made signs to his father to find out what he would like the name of, to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God, and all the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? for the Lord's hand was with him. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he has said through the holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy on our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness 
until he appeared publicly to Israel. Again, we see these parallel stories in the Gospels of Mary and Joseph and Zechariah and Elizabeth, both miraculous stories, both stories of a humble people that God will use in this narrative of salvation for us today. Zechariah's words were to declare what John the Baptist would accomplish and also stating what Jesus would accomplish. Now, it's important at times we try to romanticize Scripture at times, especially during Christmas. We're all beautiful lights and kind of have this good feeling about us. But think about what was going on in the context of that day. Warren Wiersbe wrote this. He said, in the context of Israel, during that time in history, it was indeed a dark day for the nation of Israel. The people had heard no word from God for 400 years, not since Malachi, that we read the last book in the Old Testament until now. The spiritual leaders at that time were shackled by tradition and in some instances, corruption. And their king, Herod the Great, was a tyrant. He had nine and some say 10 wives, one of whom he had executed for no apparent reason. Imagine the fear. But no matter how dark it was in that turbulent time, God always had devoted people, humble people that he raises up to serve, to be his representatives of his heart to the world. And we see that today in Zechariah and Elizabeth. For the birth of John was not expected. For John's mother, Elizabeth, as we read, was older in age, and God chooses another unlikely couple. For those that humble themselves before him. Now, friends, he's not perfect. Zechariah is not, and we read earlier that Zechariah doubted that this was going to take place, right? He doubted that Elizabeth, who was older in age, was going to have a child, so he was silenced for the pregnancy. Now, ladies, just imagine your husband being silent for four or five months, right, at this time. I won't comment any more about that. (laughs) Zechariah is quieted for months while Elizabeth is pregnant, and when the child is born, They name him John. Now that goes against the tradition of the day. He was supposed to be named something after someone in the family, probably Zechariah. He'd be Zechariah Jr. or something like that. But they say he is John because the angel Gabriel told him this baby was going to be named John and there was something special about him. He is not going to be a normal child. He has been appointed by God. And it's interesting, I was reading just an article too about the importance of life that a child in the womb, right, to value all life. This child, John, grew, and he was going to be a prophet of the Most High God. Zechariah declares who this baby, John, was going to be, and we look, if you want to look back at your scriptures, if you have them out, in Luke 1, 76, Luke writes Zechariah's words, and he says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. His role was to prepare the way for Jesus and preparation in our lives is very important. The Nelson family is privileged this year. We have a lot of preparation to do. David's graduating from Oskaloosa High School this year and Mary is getting married in June. We have some preparations to do. Some still left to be done, but others we've made. But we prepare for these events. We prepare in order that everyone involved hopefully will have a wonderful time, that we can celebrate with people that we love. Preparation, training, planning is important to carry out the important work that is to follow. And that is what this child, this baby, John, is going to do. Now John would be a unique teacher, friends. He was not normal. If he were to walk into our church today, we would probably take a second look at him. But if we look back at the text, we see Zechariah's words. What John was to bring was good news. 
Look with me at Luke 1, 68 and 69, verses 68 and 69. He says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David. Two things I want to look at in this, this short description of who Jesus was going to be, who John was going to be declaring redemption and salvation. Redemption is being set free by paying a price. Jesus will give his life so that we don't have to. Yes, we will die an earthly death, but the redemption which Christ offers is that we will no longer be in bondage to sin and death or pain any longer. That the way of living with Christ is different. That because of Jesus, there is hope that one day our pain on this earth will end and that we know that right now we can trust God as we walk through whatever circumstances we have. The redemption of Christ, what he has brought, John will declare. He will also declare salvation. And salvation means a health and soundness, peace in our hearts and minds, as well as eventual salvation and saved into heaven. That we can experience heaven to some extent right now with soundness and peace of mind in whatever we experience in life. Jesus will bring that to those who believe in him and trust in him. For God rescues us from difficult situations, friends. He rescues us from ourselves. He rescues us from each other. And he rescues us from the evil that can come in this lifetime if we but trust in him. For he provides a peace that we can't even comprehend nor understand. John is going to declare the redemption and the salvation that comes through Jesus. He will prepare the way for that word. And it's fitting for us to participate in communion today, to remember what Christ offers us, what he has done for us, and how grateful we are to be. This past Thursday, our family celebrated Denny Brand's life. Denny is... Uh, my wife Shelly, it was her father, my father-in-law. And he passed last Sunday morning from this life into the next. And what was fitting is that during the family gathering, there was a lot of people that gathered. Uh, it was a large family, extended family. And just these impromptu speeches that came from Shelly's brothers, they got up and just shared with the family asking each one to take an inventory of their life. To ask, if we were to die today, where would we be? Because we didn't know all the family members. You know how that is. There's some extended family. You don't know where everybody's at spiritually in their life. But friends, we say today and every day, and this will always be a church that will declare that salvation is in no other than Jesus Christ. No other. John the Baptist's role would be to preach this life-giving and life-saving news again and again. This little baby, this miraculous little baby born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. But he was very unique as well. One writer discussed how John disciplined himself and instead of enjoying a comfortable life, he disciplined himself out in the desert to prepare his heart and mind for his ministry to the people of Israel. We see in Matthew 3 a quick picture of who John was, a description of him. Matthew 3, 4, it says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole world around the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John was a unique individual. He was set apart to do that work. People came to him for spiritual healing in their lives. And John knew his role. We even see later what Jesus says about John. He says, truly I tell you, those among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John. This is Jesus' words. Yet, whoever is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I'm going to say it again. 
Jesus says, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This idea of humility, this idea of being the least of these, Jesus exalts. What encouragement to all of us in our lives. Friends, there's only one John the Baptist and he ended up losing his life for the convictions of him telling people to repent from their sin and to follow. Follow Jesus. Follow his teaching. Follow his ways. Be like him. Through the spirit of God that we would have hearts like him. Not just doing the right things but loving to do the right things. And we are Christ's ambassadors now in our world. Friends, what are we doing to prepare the way for Jesus coming again? We know the first advent, as a child he comes. But what are we doing as the second advent will come? Well, he will come as a king. And we will all be on our faces, bow down to him, acknowledging him as the Lord and king of all. What are we doing between now and then? For those that believe in Jesus, we are ambassadors as John the Baptist was. We are to Share, we are to go and tell. A friend of mine and maybe yours, uh, Boyd Latchaw, he was a member at Central who passed away from this earthly life a couple years ago. And one of his favorite Bible verses was this, and I'll never forget it. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This is what we get to do now, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I love that line, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal his appeal of who he is, his love, his redemption, his salvation through us. What a privilege to share the good news in a world that's hurting. How are we doing, friends, as ambassadors for Christ? This child who we celebrate being born is the savior of the world. He is the only one that brings meaning to our life and to our eternity. What is different about our lives? That people would look at us and speak and say, something, they've got something. What is that? It's Jesus. Are we living in such a way that the world would be attracted to Jesus because of who we are? I'd like to share a very attractive story. Again, it's about, uh, it's about Denny and his life, and I never got to share this, um, and so I want to share it with you today. I will never forget how he modeled an attractive life for Jesus. In 1996, Shelly and I were just recently married. We lived in Waukee, Iowa. I was a fourth grade teacher at the time, and Shelly was going to Drake University. And we attended uh, Shelly's brother, Tim. He played basketball for Pella. <laughs> now, that was the only time in history that we cheered for Pella. <laughs> but we did. Things have changed. But we cheered for Tim and his team. And this game didn't go well for them, and they lost. And we went down to the court after the game. We were waiting for the guys to come out of the locker room. If you've been to a game, sometimes that happens. You know, people congregate, and they wait for the players to come out. Well, as usual, the family gathered together, and Denny and I started talking about our interpretation of the game, how it went. And we disagreed. Um, it actually got to the point where it, it, we adamantly disagreed about what we thought happened of why Pella lost. And the disagreement actually got a little heated. 
And believe it or not, we left the gym not on good terms that evening because we were both a little proud and said our piece, didn't agree, and we walked away. Shelly and I drove home an hour away to Waukee. The next day, there's a knock on our apartment door. It's Denny. He is crying, and he hugged us both, and he said he was so sorry for his comments last night. We all hugged, and the relationship was made right again. He drove an hour to say he was sorry. I was talking to somebody afterwards, you know, now we just send a text, I'm sorry. Or we tell him on the telephone. He drove an hour to restore relationship. You see, friends, asking for forgiveness restores relationship. And forgiveness is the way we sinful human beings love one another. Amen? Forgiveness is the way that we sinful human beings love one another. That is attractive to me. What makes your life attractive to others? How will we be ambassadors for Christ? Zechariah and Elizabeth were faithful to the plans that God had for them. We see the impact of his son, John the Baptist, later in the Gospels. He prepares the way for Jesus. For just as John declared the coming of Jesus to the people of Israel, we too have an opportunity to declare in humility what Christ has done for us. Because friends, the world needs humility. We don't need more arguments. We don't need more positions to hold. We need humility and love. May we continue to model that and to share the good news of Christ in a world that so desperately needs it. I don't know if uh, maybe you got an email this week if you're involved with the school systems but there was this TikTok thing that said that there should be harm, kids should do harm at the school on Friday, this past Friday. And we get this, this letter that says through this engagement on social media that there could be harm in the school. So they, they bolstered um, the police influence that day at school. Thankfully, nothing happened. But then I watched another PBS News Hour the other day and it discussed a website on how people could take their own life. And people were using it. It was encouraging people. Death, evil, awful and evil stuff, friends. And the world needs to hear the good news the good news that Jesus brings redemption and salvation. We're going to make it easy to invite someone to Christmas Eve. We've got these cards at the Welcome Center, and we just encourage you to take a card, invite someone. We're going to preach the gospel at Christmas Eve. Take one, hand it to a friend. Invite someone on email or Facebook. Let's prepare the way to hear the good news. Friends, may we all have the simple courage to invite, to see what God will do in someone's life, to be an ambassador, and it does take courage, and it takes us to step out of our comfort zone at times. But we are to go tell it on the mountain, everywhere we go. How will we prepare hearts for the good news of the coming of Jesus? For one thing I keep continually reminding myself of as I've done a lot of different funerals now and been a part of one as a family. Life is brief. Life is short. What are we spending our time on? May we go and tell. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for you for your spirit that resides with us, that comforts us, that gives us strength and courage that grieves with us.
Father, our lives are about you. Help us orient our lives around who you are and not so much what we want. For you came to this world to redeem and to save and we celebrate that today as we turn our attention to communion. We think in this this sacrament, this moment, that it alivens our senses to think about with the bread and the juice as we eat it, as it goes down into our stomachs, that there's presence with us. We do the sacrament for it's in a tangible way we experience it. God, thank you as we approach the table. We come to remember your life, death, resurrection. We come in hope. Hope one day that we'll be with you. But until that time, we celebrate your spirit that's with us to guide us and to direct us. Father, help us to love each other well. Help us to model your love of forgiveness, compassion, truth to a world that so desperately needs it and to each of us who desperately need it. So Father, in unity, we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples in saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.